Borthakur IS Academy, an endeavor of excellence. Borthakur IS Academy. Hello everyone. Welcome to Borthakur IS Academy, Northeast's premier institute for UPSC, APSC and NPSC preparations. I'm your friend Atri and today I'm here with another segment of Current Affairs 365 dated 15th of May 2021. Don't forget to like and share this video and also if you have not subscribed to our channel yet, please consider subscribing. You can also follow us on Facebook as well as Instagram. So without any further ado, let's get started. So the first news of today is regarding an order which has been passed by the Supreme Court in order to tackle the issue of overcrowding of prison during this pandemic. Okay, so Supreme Court of India has ordered the interim release of some eligible prisoners keeping in view the uncontrolled second surge in the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, Supreme Court has ordered so in order to decongest the jails and also to protect the right to life and health of the prisoners. So under this particular order, the authorities in all the districts of our country, they are advised to give effect to the section 436A of CRPC, that is Code of Criminal Procedure. Under the section of 436A of the Code of Criminal Procedure, those under trials who have completed half of the maximum prison term prescribed for any offense, they are uh, eligible to be released on personal bond. And they have also suggested the legislature to consider the idea of placing convicts under house arrest in order to avoid overcrowding of the prisons. Because the occupancy rate of Indian prisons, it climbed to 118.5% in 2019. And along with it, a very large sum of budget is required for the maintenance of the prisons also. So that is why as a preventive measure, our Supreme Court, they have ordered all the states uh, to constitute some high-powered committees and determine the class of prisoners who could be released on bail for a specified period. The Indian prisons, mainly they are facing three long-standing structural constraints, which includes overcrowding, understuffing and underfunding, and the violent clashes which arises among the prisoners in jail. So uh, the second news is regarding enforced or involuntary disappearances. Recently, the United Nations, they have a United Nations Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances. They have received certain reports of enforced disappearances from the family members of the victims in Myanmar, uh, which is after the COP in Myanmar, right? And this practice of enforced disappearances, it has been seen as a tool to suppress the people who are raising their voice for their freedom, okay, and against the milita military rule in Myanmar. Now, what is this enforced disappearance all about? It is a practice where a person is secretly imprisoned or abducted, okay, under the influence of a political party or any third party which uh, refuses to acknowledge the person's fate and whereabouts. And this is done, this is being done with an intention to place the victim outside the protection of law. And this whole concept of enforced disappearances, it mainly became uh, famous during the 1970s and er early 1980s during the process of national reorganization in Argentina. This was a practice in Argentina, uh, which, waged, which was waged by the Argentina's military dictatorship against some suspected left-wing political opponents. So now the constituents of enforced disappearances, it includes deprivation of liberty against the will of the person. Secondly, it also involves uh, government official and strong political organizations. And third, most important fact is that they, this particular practice, it refuses to acknowledge the deprivation of liberty or the fate or and whereabouts of the disappeared person or the victim. And if we uh, look, have a look at the recent occurrences, then it was uh, re the most recent cases in Myanmar where the uh, police, they are trying to uh, suppress the demand of freedom of expression and restoration of democracy of the common people and there they are carrying out unimaginable acts of violence and oppress oppression against these people. Okay. Then also in China, the uh, Uyghur minority ethnic group members, they are forcibly sent to the 
vocational education and training centers with no information on their whereabouts. This is mainly done under the pretext of re-educating them to prevent terrorism. Cases of uh, enforced disappearances were also reported in Sri Lanka, Pakistan and Bangladesh. So the United Nations Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances, it was formed in the year 1980 and since then it has been assisting families in determining the whereabouts of their family members who have reportedly disappeared. Okay. Now, if we have a look at these enforced disappearances, we have seen that it is a serious crime which is against humanity because the pain and suffering of those family members whose, uh, you know, one of the member goes missing, it is unimaginable. And also, if we have a look at the recent cases of occurrence, then we see that all these nations are Asian countries. So the Asian countries, they should particularly consider their obligations and responsibilities more seriously and reject this serious uh, crime and work for eradication of enforced disappearances. The domestic criminal law system also here is not sufficient enough to deal with the crime of enforced disappearance. So uh, it needs to have a comprehensive approach to fight against it. Moreover, the international community, they must strengthen their efforts to eradicate enforced disappearances at the earliest. So the third news is coming from the state of Odisha, where a recent spread of COVID infection among the vulnerable tribal groups is seen. Okay, as many as eight different particularly vulnerable tribal groups, they got infected with the second during the second wave of COVID-19. Now, if we have a look at the tribal groups of Odisha, then as per the census of 2011, Odisha's share of the country's total tribal population was 9%. And in terms of number of its tribal population, Orissa occupies third position in India. Of the 62 tribal groups which resides in Orissa, 13 of them are recognized as particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Now we will see what is this particularly vulnerable tribal group all about and we will also see how government is trying to help such groups okay, uh, by providing certain schemes for them. So, uh, in the year 1973, the government, they created a primitive tribal group based, uh, which was a separate category, okay, because these people, these tribal groups, they were uh, less developed among all the other tribal groups, okay. So, they were separated and they were termed as primitive tribal groups. And in the year 2006, the government of India renamed the primitive tribal groups as particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Now, there are certain criteria, okay, there are certain conditions based on which the government segregates one tribal group and uh, puts it in the primitive, in the, uh, in, in the group of primitive, uh, sorry, particularly vulnerable tribal groups. So, the characteristics includes the relative physical isolation of that group, then stagnant or declining population of that group. Also, it includes their low literacy rate and absence of any written language. So if these things are seen, if these points are seen in, a, in any particular tribal group, then they are covered under this particularly vulnerable tribal group. And moreover, if their livelihood includes pre-agricultural stage of economy or practice of uh, hunting, food gathering, shift cultivation and terrace cultivation, etc. That means they don't have proper education. They don't have a pro good source of uh, income, right? So, uh, because of these reasons, a particular group, tribal group is targeted as a particularly vulnerable tribal group. And in order to help these groups, the government of India, they have come up with many different types of schemes. Uh, one of them includes the development of PVTGs, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. They have implemented this scheme, which covers 75 particularly vulnerable tribal groups for their comprehensive socio-economic development. And under this scheme, the state governments, they submit a conservation come development plan on the basis of their requirement and 100% grants in aid are made available to the states as per the provisions of the scheme. The next news is regarding the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi or the PM Kisan scheme. The Prime Minister recently released the eighth installment of financial benefit under this scheme. 
and uh, here under this scheme the center transfers an amount of rupees 6000 per year in three equal installments directly into the bank accounts of all the land holding farmers irrespective of their uh, size of the land holdings right and this scheme was launched in the year february 2019 this scheme is centrally funded okay and 100% uh, funding comes from the government of india the ministry nodal ministry is ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare the entire responsibility of identification of beneficiary families okay it this it rests within the state and the union territory government the main objective of this scheme was to supplement the financial needs of the small and marginal farmers so that they can procure various inputs to ensure proper crop growth and appropriate yields okay also this aims at protecting them from falling into the clutches of money lenders for meeting such expenses and ensures their continuance in the farming activity next let us have a look at the necessary reforms which is required in world health organization and recently a report was released by an independent panel which was co-chaired by former new zealand prime minister helen clark this particular panel it linked the severity of the global outbreak to the deficiencies across the multilateral organizations government of the nations and specifically the world health organization okay so here the issues all the issues which were raised by this panel these are listed here and we will be discussing them one by one first being late warning uh, the world health organization they could have warned the countries uh, about the severity of this virus within the first few weeks of the pandemic itself right so that the people could have been aware of the uh, magnitude and also uh, they could have taken certain precautionary measures by themselves it was not done right first is that secondly late declaration of the pandemic the uh, world health organization they could have declared the outbreak in wuhan itself as a pu public health emergency of international concern uh, which could have been the highest level of global alert by the uh, by at least 22nd of january 2020 but they waited for the uh, member states approval china's approval to declare it as a pandemic right so this uh, is linked to the third point which is a weak body the world health organization they could have showed it, its power okay to investigate the outbreak speedily and also uh, with guaranteed rights of access and with the ability to publish information but what they did they waited for the uh, member states approval so this particular point at this particular step proves that world health organization worked as a weak body in such a crucial time so the fourth point is a month of lost opportunities most countries they failed to uh, you know heed to the warning and chose to wait and see rather than taking firm measures that could have contained the virus at the early stages itself next there is the need for greater role by international organization obviously the world health organization world trade organization they should have come up with uh, better agreement policies among the major vaccine producing countries which would have not only accelerated the process of manufacture of vaccines but also uniform distribution of the vaccines among the entire population of the world right sixth is the need for a specialized council here the panel has called for the creation of a global health threats council that will maintain political commitment to pandemic preparedness and also response and hold actors accountable for the same and seventh uh, point which has been raised by the panel is that the change in financing here the panel it emphasized on the need of an international pandemic financing facility that is capable of disbursing around 5 billion to 10 billion dollars per year for preparedness and around uh, 50 billion to 100 billion dollars in case of event of a crisis and lastly the panel recommended a single seven year term for the world health organization's Gen uh, director general and the regional directors so that this situation like this is not repeated in future and uh, we are well prepared as a nation uh, sorry as a world as as a unit we re pre remain well prepared for any such future viral outbreaks so this was all for today i hope you liked this video and it was useful for you all 
Please like and share and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. I'll see you all again tomorrow with another segment of Current Affairs 365 only at Bodhakus IAS Academy, Northeast's premier institute for UPSC, APSC and NPSC preparations. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. Bodhakur IAS Academy Prostuti aru adhyanar nirbhar jugyathikona Bodhakur IAS Academy